Hello, everyone. My name is Xi Hong Peng, and I'm your host for the Mindpreneur Podcast Show, on which I interview successful entrepreneurs to explore their entrepreneur journey, and hopefully, I can inspire you, my audience, to think like a startup or entrepreneur when you tackle your challenges in your own industry or you are starting up. And joining me today is a engineer turned entrepreneur, CEO, and co-founder of Best Tech. Who sees the world as opportunities as opposed to bottlenecks? Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Sion. So、uh, I'll do a quick intro on Bestec. Founded in 1995, Bestec was created to address the need for system integration and industrial automation. By developing a very specialized skill set, Bestec quickly gained recognition as a leader in industrial automation, engineering, software development, and environmental monitoring. With over a decade of sustainable growth, Bestec developed a strong industry expertise by responding and developing innovative technologies that helps companies in mining, pulp and paper, forestry, oil and gas, manufacturing, municipal and commercial industries internationally enhance their productivity, profitability, and safety. So, Mark, I'll let you introduce yourself to our audience, please. Okay. Well,、uh, good afternoon, and thanks, Siang, for giving me this opportunity to、uh, to speak with you and uh, and uh, the folks that are listening in.、Um, so, like Siang said, my name is Mark Boudreau, and I am CEO of、uh, Best Tech. And Best Tech is actually、uh, one of the main one of the main companies that's part of our、uh, group of companies. So we have Best Tech, we have Shift Incorporated. And we also have Admit. Those are the three companies that we're managing under our group of companies. Perfect. So,、uh, for Best Tech group of companies, what's your revenue for 2018?、Uh, for 2018, we、uh, we had a great year. We we generated 17 million dollars of revenue last year. Excellent. Yes. And how many people are you employing right now? Right now, we're employing 120 employees. Oh wow, that's almost one hundred fifty thousand per annual sales per employee. Yeah, that's that's, very, that's very astute, and yeah, that's definitely one of the KPIs we try to to maintain.、Yeah. Okay, well, very good job. So,、uh, did you always know that you were gonna to be、uh, you're going to be an entrepreneur when you grew up, or it was kind of a, a came to you as a surprise? Yeah. So no, the answer is I didn't know as I was growing up that I was going to be an entrepreneur.、Um, I come from a,、uh, a blue collar family、um, where、uh, my father was a miner and、uh, my mother was a stay stay at home mom. So that's kind of the environment that I was brought into. So I thought I'd be more or less a labor、uh, as a as a as a as a job. That's what I thought I would end up ha- having.、Uh, but throughout my、uh, my high school, I, I figured out that、um, I had a little bit more capabilities. And、uh, I ended up going to university, where uh, I uh, I received an, an engineering degree in electrical engineering. And then actually, I, let's pause yeah, a second there, because、sure. in our pre-interview, you told a much more interesting <laughs> story than that. <laughs> okay. So、uh, back in high school,、yes. you were、uh, more into sports than into school activities. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So when I was in high school.、Uh, My mandate was to achieve a, just an average, an average score at at school, and、uh, so I dedicated my、uh, my time to sports. Is is what I did, and as long as I maintained an average an average grade, I was happy with that.、Uh, I dedicated most of my time to to sports, and in grade twelve,、uh, when I was playing football, I actually broke my leg, and I was in the cast for about two months, and I really had nothing to do with my time. So、uh, I figured, well, why don't I spend some time studying? And I figured out that well, it wasn't that hard to study,、uh, and I also understood the correlation between the amount of work you put into your studies、uh, really equates to the grades you get. It's pretty simple, right? And、uh, so I went from an average student to a top of the class student,、oh, wow. and that's when I, you know, I understood that I, I had, you know, I, had, I, I could do a lot more in my life. Right, right, but then. Because of your exposure to more the general labor market、yes. rather than engineering,、yeah. uh, so how how did you make that decision to leap into engineering? Yeah, so that's that's another great question. So in life, you you、um, 
you get exposed to situations and really they're just they're, there's roads that you, you you go down and then you hit a roadblock or, or not necessarily a roadblock but uh you uh you have these situations where you're either going to go right or left and uh so when i when i broke my left it was that my leg that was one of these situations where i decided to go down a different path than my life was going and uh Another of these situations occurred when my guidance counselor sat me down and asked me uh, what I want to do in my life. And I said, well, I'm going to go to college and be an electrician. And again, that's, I, that's, that was what I figured I'd be doing because that's the life that I was brought up into. And uh, he explained to me that I had great marks and that I should consider going to university, right. which is something I never even considered. Even though I had great grades, I still didn't consider it. And then he said, yeah, you should try engineering. And, and from the world I come in, I didn't know what an engineer was. And that's when I was 18 years old, like old enough, right? But I right. never even heard the term an engineer. I didn't know what they what they provide to society. Right. So I decided to, to listen to him and uh, I decided to go to, to engineering just based on his recommendation. So he changed my life. Yeah. In a, in so a that's a five way. minute conversation that yeah. basically completely changed your life 180 yeah. degrees. And it totally changed my life. And, and to circle back to your first question, you know, did I ever think I was an entrepreneur? Well, the one thing in high school, even though I dedicated my life to sports, um, I always find myself being team captains of these sports. Right. Right. Whether it's football or wrestling or whatever. Uh, so I had a natural ability to be a leader. But at the time, I got to tell, I didn't really realize it. You know, every team needed a captain and okay, right, I'll right. be the captain, no big deal. Um, but I think, you know, fundamentally there's leaderships, leadership skills in that, that I, I recognize today now. Right. Okay. That's, uh, that's definitely one of the core competencies mm -hmm. when you want to be an entrepreneur, you need to be able to lead. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So then you ended up in University of Ottawa, electrical mm -hmm. engineering. Yes. And how was that experience? Uh, that experience was uh, was challenging for me, and I, I think it was challenging because I, I waited so long uh, in my life to to really start learning and developing skills on how to learn. You know, that that came to me when I was seventeen or eighteen, uh, and then I went straight into university. So it was a little challenging for me. I really, really had to work hard to 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 get good grades, and probably a lot of people work hard to get good grades in at university, but I've, I felt that I spent a little bit more time than most people, I think, doing homework and just catching up. Right. right? That's that's what I find, too, because in your in high school, you're probably just competing or not competing, but you are uh, looking at the peers around you. Mm -hmm. You probably are the top 3%, mm -hmm. but now you are going to the capital of the yeah. nation, uh, yeah. one of the best universities, and then you're basically competing with whole different level it was definitely intimidating right absolutely yeah. right but you graduated yeah. but i graduated and i gotta tell you when when i finished university um i felt that i had a lot of confidence in my abilities to tackle any problem and that's really what university gave me right it's not necessarily the specifics about math and sciences and all that it's just they gave me a good foundation to learn right and have have the confidence in my abilities to pick up anything and learn it and do well at it right that's that's yeah. excellent mm -hmm. so after you finished school from university of ottawa mm -hmm. you uh, landed a job i landed a job at falconbridge here in sudbury as as an electrical engineer okay and uh yeah so again even at that point in time so now i'm like whatever 22 23 i didn't even realize that they had electrical engineers in mining Right. But they have all the disciplines in engineering. It's actually a, a, a fascinating industry, the mining industry. Exactly. Yeah. You're right on. Often there's misperception out there about mining. Yeah. A lot of people still see it as a dark hole yeah. that we pick and shovel yeah. material from uh, the mine to surface. But many people didn't even realize that mm -hmm. there's a whole different world of expertise and yeah. talent pool. So I was riding actually an Uber uh, in Montreal from my hotel to a conference. And then I was chatting with the driver and I said, so, so what do you do other than driving an Uber? And he said, uh, I'm a uh, student in computer science here mm. in Montreal. I said, uh, oh, that's pretty cool. How do you like it? And he totally enjoys it and said, uh, so what do you uh, plan to do after you graduate? He said, uh, well, I'll find a job. I said, uh, 
Well, maybe keep your eyes open for mining because yeah. we definitely need computer scientists Absolutely. in the years to come. Yeah. And I was totally in awe, like, really? <laughs> mining? I didn't know mining was hiring computer scientists. Yeah. So that was a totally eye-opener for him yeah. because traditionally mining is not a high-tech or a sexy industry that young kids want to yeah. get into. That's correct. And we need to change that. And I'm hoping this podcast will shed some light on the fascinating aspect of mining. And I think Best Deck is doing fantastic in that regard exactly. to kind of a, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later sure. about uh, how you recruit talents for, uh, to rebrand that image of mining. Yeah. But then, so what, what did you do exactly? Or what are the limitations? at Falcon Bridge that uh, made you think, well, maybe I should start my own thing. Yeah, so that's that's a good question. So uh, my background is electrical engineer, as you know, and uh, after working at Falcon Bridge for five years, I figured that I wanted to be doing something else. So I understood the industry a little bit more because I did work uh, underground, implementing systems underground, and I right. also implemented systems in the mills and implemented systems in the smelting operation. So I got a better understanding of the whole mining process. And uh, and I wanted to play a different role than an electrical engineering role. I wanted to get into actually the mining side of things and the mining engineering and the mine planning and the mine, all the management at that level. Right, and right. that was not available for me as electrical engineer, unfortunately. Right. And you didn't yeah. see any member on the senior management team exactly. coming from a electrical background. Well, that's true. You, you look at any mining operation, even today, and ask the question, how many of the senior leadership are electrical engineers? And good luck finding 0.1%. <laughs> right, right. And that's yeah. the way it is. Well, it's a mining play. So it makes right. sense that mining engineers are going to move around uh, within that industry. Right. right. If I was an electrical engineer working for uh, a power generation company, then, you know, maybe then there's a lot more senior management that are electrical right. engineers. That right. But you, have a, but you have an electrical engineering background. Yeah. You are in a mining company. You mm -hmm. see there is limitations. There are Absolutely. ceilings in your career development. In my career development, yeah. uh, But there could be many other options. Like you could work yeah. for a power company or, and have very great yeah. development given yeah. your abilities. Yes. Uh, so why, what, what, what was on your mind when you uh, finally had that defining moment? Yeah, I want to do this yeah. on my own. And then what were some of the, because as an engineer, we tend to analyze things, uh, right. you know, technically, what are the pros, cons, risks, and rewards. Mm -hmm. So what, what was on, my, on your mind mm -hmm. at that moment? Well, I knew that, um, that, I, was big, that I was limited within, within uh, that company, that specific company at the time. Right. So I wanted to do something different. And also um, my work at that time was, uh, a lot of it was project management and we were um, managing a lot of consultants at the time. So I saw uh, the consulting world as an opportunity for me to maybe change my path, right? So uh, as a process control and automation engineer, which is what I became uh, known for, as a skill set within the mining uh, company I was with, um, I needed some help. So we did hire consultants and all of them came from, from Toronto area. There right. was really no marketplace in Northern Ontario to offer process control and automation type of uh, engineering services, consulting right. services. So I just looked at that and I said, you know what, I think there's a need right. for this type of service to be offered in Northern Ontario. And I also had five years of uh, practical experience. So I figured, you know, I've got, everything I need to, to start up and, and run best deck from that perspective. Right. I hear you. Uh, but I guess at that point you had a family already. You yes. Two kids. I yeah, think. <laughs> that's true. So <laughs> how, how did you persuade your wife actually to say that, yeah. Hey, uh, honey, I want to start this business, even yeah. though I don't have any idea if I'm going to have a steady income uh, that I have right now. Okay, that so here, here's a little bit of that story. So when I graduated in 89, I met my wife in 1990 right away, like within six months of graduating. She was working at Falcon Bridge. And my partner, Dennis Petrie, who was my business partner, worked also at Falcon Bridge. He was hired. So the three of us sat down in 1990 and said, hey, wouldn't it be cool to have our own engineering company? But we quickly realized we just didn't have enough experience. 
Right. Okay. So we talked about this and I have actually meeting minutes of that meeting on acetates. So I don't know if you know what that is, but then <laughs> yeah, the, it's a, the, 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 no, it's a plastic that you put over a projector and you project the notes oh, on the wall. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so I, I have I, the meeting minutes and acetate. Anyway, so I still have that today. So, so in my mind, my wife knew that this was a dream of mine, right? So five years later, when I finally made the decision that I was going to start off and I was going to go on my own, I just tendered my resignation letter to my boss. And I said, look, I'm going to start my own company and I just want you to know about this. So he was a little bit shocked and surprised. And, um, and, but I did it. So then I came home and I said, Hey honey, guess what? I, I, I decided to follow our dream. She said, well, what's that? I said, well, remember five years ago, we talked about starting our own company. Well, I just quit my job and I'm starting my company. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> yeah. And I thought she would like be all on board with this right away because we had our meeting five years ago, right? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she was a little worried, but I just showed her my plan. Oh, so you had a I had solid a, plan. Uh, well, I don't know right. if I'd call it solid, but I had a couple of uh, pages of, of written, like as a little mini plan, let's say. And uh, she said, well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make you a good business plan. So we worked on that for a couple of weeks and, and she felt comfortable that because the plan showed that we'd be successful. Right. So what's that saying? If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Right. right. right so, yeah. well, me to me, plan is about it's everything. Before you do anything, plan, plan, plan. Right. So that's what I did. I, I showed her the plan and we worked on it together. And we said, look, this is going to work, right? For these reasons. So the plan showed. So in a successful. couple of weeks, she was sold. She was sold. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. And she's an engineer as well. So I knew that, you know, from a cash flow perspective, we'd be okay. If, cause I, it always takes a little bit of time for you to start generate positive cash flow when you start a new company. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of your plan B. Uh, yeah, plan. Well, it's part of the plan is knowing that there's some cash flow coming from her her uh, her job as well. So right. That's excellent. It made but, it a little simpler for me. Right. Then, you what what were you planning to offer exactly? Uh, services so, or yeah, products? The, or? At the time, it was very simply uh, process control and automation services. So PLC programming, HMI programming, and the engineering that goes around integrating PLCs and processes. So there's some engineering uh, that's needed for that. So my business plan called for five employees, two engineers and three designers, and uh, some hardware and some software to, to develop the plans and to do the programming or whatever. And uh, it was, yeah, pretty simple. So to make yeah. that work, I guess initially you need funding yes. from uh, yeah. investors or uh, different sources. Yeah. How did you get the funding? Yeah, so for me, there's two two aspects to the funding. Um, I had been saving for the for four years at least anyway, and enough money so that I knew that my cash flow was okay for a year. So By the I, way, that, so was, had, uh, had, that was very uncommon among yeah. younger professionals to save. Well, that's true, yeah. That's true. But I managed to save, I'll just say $90,000, which was a lot of money back then. Oh, wow. But still, that was my cash flow money. That was not my startup For the family, business, right. Right? So in order to start up the business, I, I, I received a $150,000 loan from TD, which is still our primary bank 25 years later. And I they, can understand the why. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit of the story behind you? Yeah. Did you get the rejections from uh, other institutions? Well, absolutely. So at first, I, I said, well, I'm going to go talk to our city and see if they have any kind of funding programs to help me uh, and uh, our city at the time. And I don't know if it's like that today, but they didn't have funds for professionals, which was kind of shocking to me. Uh, so then I went to the banks and I went to all the banks and I got rejected. And the only one that uh, accepted my uh, my request was TD. And of course, I had to mortgage my home and all that. But uh, at least they gave me an opportunity. Right, and right. and I got to tell you, within a year, that loan was paid off. So how how so much did they uh, yeah. provide? Uh, it was a loan. Yeah, it was one hundred fifty thousand. One hundred fifty, and you paid yeah. that back but within in a, a year, year. In a year, yeah. Oh wow! That, so they back. really saw something in yeah. your business plan, or in you that yeah. uh, could yeah. work. Yeah, within a year, we had the five uh, people employed, and I think our revenue was three hundred fifty thousand dollars or something like that. Oh wow! So right That's away, so. excellent for the first year. Yeah, and it is excellent, and really, again, that was the plan, right? The plan was that we had a we had a uh, uh, a group of people that were professionals, and a domain that we felt that Northern Ontario was underserviced, and that was providing 
process control and automation engineering services to the clients here in Northern Ontario. And we were right about that. So your competitive advantage would yeah. be local, local. Uh, expertise? That's or? right. Yeah, local expertise. Okay. Yeah. Uh, At a good price. Oh, you, you priced it well, uh, yeah. more competitively as well, well. Exactly. So we're competing against the firms in Toronto, which were bigger firms as well. So we could have you know a tighter, uh, a better cost uh, model for our clients. Yeah. So running a business, like you mentioned, there is a cost component, there is pricing, there is yeah. planning. So mm -hmm. there's legal accounting. Mm -hmm. uh, did you all figure that? out by yourself or you, you uh, got mentors or well at, at first it was just me yeah <laughs> and, and we have an accounting firm uh and i've been with them for the tw for 25 years and and uh, the bookkeeper we had at the time she still still she still talks about that you know once a month mark would show up his little gray binder of with all his receipts and everything nicely organized for me to do my job oh, so man, that's, that's yeah cool, when you first so. start off yeah you're kind of a one-man show but it's not complicated you know, it's really not that complicated. Okay. In terms because of sometimes it's just the way overthought yeah. or overthink the processes and, yeah. and kind of hinder yeah. ourselves. Yeah. No, like when I first started, I, I, I'll be honest, I didn't really understand uh, financial statements, process and uh, uh, not process, but profit and loss statements and balance sheets. And all that. Right. I didn't really know what they were. I'd never really seen these, but I managed the finances of my home. So I understood income coming in and stood costs right so that's kind of how i ran it at first which is really a p l statement right. understands your revenue and your costs i just didn't put it in the format that was in the pnl format so the, all the concepts were there and i'd provide the data to my uh, accountants i ran my own reports using microsoft money like i managed my home finances but i managed my business that way and it was okay to start right. off you right know, start off you just simplify it all Right. Legal was not really a big requirement at the time either. Okay. I didn't have a lot of employees, so it's it was it's all very doable. Okay, mm -hmm. that's excellent. And I guess as a you are providing professional services, yeah. you also have got to have insurance coverage. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's that's simple enough though. So I noticed on the uh, Industry Canada website, uh, your uh, your company was incorporated under a different name. Yes. In 1995. Five, yeah. What was the initial name of the company? Yeah. So, um, all right. So today the corporation is called Boudreaux SB Pitt Corporation. Right. And we operate as Best Tech. Right. Okay. Back then, when we first started off, it was called Boudreaux Systems, Boudreaux SB Systems Technology. Oh, that's how Best Tech that's came out? That's how Best Tech came out, okay? <laughs> BES Tech, Boudreaux Espli Systems Technology. That's cool. So that's how it that's how it started off, and Espli is my wife's last name. Okay. And she's never played a role in the business at all, but she's a big reason why I was able to start the business. So I felt that it was important to to show her name, right, her right. involvement I see, I from see. that level. So yeah, yeah. the Boudreaux Espli was there, and then Systems Technology. And then six or seven months after I started the company, my my business partner, Dennis, joined us in his Petri. Right. So we renamed the corporation Boudreaux Espy Pitt Corporation and maintained Best Tech, though. Okay. The Best Tech brand continues. That's, that's good. I was, I was wondering how Best Tech, what does that yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then Dennis joined you. Uh, what what yeah. was the synergy that you were seeing between yourself and uh, Dennis? Yeah, so Dennis and I, we have a long history together. We were friends when we were like four or five years old. And uh, so we've been, uh, we've, our lives have always come and gone and we've always managed to reconnect in different ways than not that we were looking for it. So when we were kids, he was my neighbor. So we hung around and played. Right, right. And then, uh, and then he moved off when maybe we were six or seven years old. And it wasn't until high school that we reconnected. And uh, so we did our university together and, uh, and then uh, went to Falconbridge together. Not that we planned that, it just sort of happened. And uh, and then the business relationship. Yeah, well, it's a really long lasting. It's a long lasting relationship. Great, yeah, he was a great partner. We just retired last year. That's good for him. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, so I guess with two partners, often people wonder if you have arguments or disagreements yeah. Yeah. on critical decision making. Yeah. Uh, how, how would you? Can you tell me if there was a, ever a time that you actually disagreed on something, and how, how did you? come about that yeah so dennis and i we've had a it was always a great relationship and uh but the first rule 
that we that we said between each other is that in order for something to go through we both have to agree that's rule oh, okay. number one and if one person doesn't agree the other person just has to accept that simple as that okay right yeah. and okay. uh and we followed that model throughout yeah that's excellent yeah because that, it's always delicate to have a friend as your business partner it is yeah okay that's, that's and good we're very use. we're very different so we uh we complement each other as well because we're different. How so? Yeah. Uh, well, he's more of the engineer kind of person, and I'm more on the business side, public facing, right? So oh, okay. it's good okay. to have the two dimensions. Okay, that's excellent. So speaking of the business side, how, how did you actually approach your first client? I, I suppose that was from your previous employment? Yeah, so my first contract came from Falconbridge. Uh, like I said, I was there for five years, and I, right. I made a lot of... Uh, Good friends when I was there, uh, but the people who hired me, they understood the skills that I had, and they knew they needed help. So they weren't so, mad that the fact that you actually left them. And no, no, they weren't mad when I left. But when Dennis left six months later, that's a whole other story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so people got a little bit annoyed at that, but uh, that didn't last very long. Okay, yeah. so but I guess uh, Falcon Bridge wasn't the only client he yeah. had in first a while. Yeah. Uh, so how did you? How did you approach other clients where when you are still fairly young mm -hmm. yeah. in the domain? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. So when uh, when I started, Falconbridge is pretty much my only client. And then when Dennis joined me, well, Falconbridge is a little bit upset. So they started closing that tap, which it was a great thing for us because it forced us to say, look, if this business is for real, we need to have other clients. We can't rely just on one. So it forced, uh, it forced us to really think about how we're going to market and how we're going to grow our client base. So obviously here in, in Sudbury Valley, it was the, uh, well, at the time it was Inco, um, was a place that we uh, we went and knocked on their door and started getting some some revenue from them. So it's just a kind of a cold call. Yeah, then, just a cold call. Say, hey, hey, we're here. here. Here's what we have to offer. And of course, they needed help. And they started hiring us right away as soon as they understood what we could provide for them. Right. So that's when you got the other client, Inco. But at yeah. that time, I guess your team needed to grow as well to satisfy the demands. Yeah. So and, yeah. in terms of uh, recruiting for your team, mm -hmm. what were the qualities or traits that mm -hmm. you were looking for back then as you know a fit for yeah. Best Tech? Yeah. So at the time, again, it was very narrow. And we call ourselves a boutique. And we were a boutique and we did process control and automation. So we're looking for electrical engineers, process engineers, and programmers, and designers as well. So we got people from university and folks from college as well on the design side of things. So it was it was pretty simple back then. Yeah, it was one discipline, right? And so it was simple to manage. Okay, so it's more focused on local recruitment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we're twelve people. At the time, whatever, right? we grew from right. six to twelve pretty quickly, so it wasn't right. that complicated. W were they actually surprised that uh, you know Best Tech was doing this cool stuff for mining? Yeah, we had a lot of uh, young employees that came in, and uh, and they had great experience with us. Yeah, yes. yeah, we offered them uh, a whole new uh, world, um, and also an introduction to the mining industry, right? Which is uh, a very important aspect of our community the social and the economical uh, aspect of our community is largely driven by the mining industry so it's exactly. a very very important part of of uh, subray it's a very important part of northern ontario um, and canada as well right yeah so later then you, you started with the plc automation control mm -hmm. then later expanded into many other areas air quality yeah. control uh, the energy management and then portals, uh, rope inspectors. So you were still more focused yeah. on the software side. Yeah. So that's yes, yeah, so that's a good point. I'd forgotten about that aspect of things. So so we had the service side of our business, where people hired us and we helped them with their specific project needs. But then we're also innovators, right? And we said, well, you know, what can we do with our company to not just be uh, reliant on service work? Can we develop solutions that the industry would want to procure from, from 
from us. And that's where those products like portals came in and rope inspector and hoist it. And those are all solutions that we built for the industry. So how did you come up with those ideas or solutions? Was it uh, more by client's demand or yeah. you were just uh, innovating in the lab? Well, the it, it was again, yeah. So it's largely from clients, from our observations of what were available for clients at the time. Right. Okay. So an example of that is hoist it. So hoist it is a, is a, is a, um, an interface that we built for hoisting plants. And at the time they were expensive and they were big bulky stations that you, you would set up to control the hoist. And we said, well, how can we make this more cost effective and simple using automation? So we built a, a whole new way of controlling hoist with, yeah. So again, it wasn't our client asking us for this as we were looking and saying, Hey, how can we do this better for them? Right. Uh, I see. And then we would do the R and D at our own cost. And he also, at the same time, I guess, was competing with uh, larger outfits or OEMs yeah. like ABB because yeah. uh, yes. they also yeah. developed their own, for example, yeah. hoist control system. Exactly. So yeah. how did you differentiate yeah. yourself from this competition? Well, OK, here's what happens, right? So you have ideas and concepts like this hoist console. Right. And what I call that? A success for us? No, because we only sold one. Okay. Right. Because we quickly realized that the marketplace was controlled by companies like ABB. Right. Right. And to compete against companies like them, that's very challenging. So these are the things that you learn as you, as you try, as you try to come up with different concepts, different processes, but you're always learning as you go. Right. Right. So sometimes you hit a roadblock like, a big corporation like that and when you're a small player yeah you're yeah you're done that's it but move i guess on. The, move on to the next you know and that's that's important right. it's important to decide at some point say look you know that marketplace is not what we thought it was we understand it more because we went and played in it okay not a good place for us let's move on and do something else I guess that's a, there's also upside to that yeah. as a small boutique engineering yeah. firm you were more agile than yeah. some of the bigger players yeah. out there so you can easily just kibosh certain division or uh, services well that's that would be nice to think that way <laughs> so so it wasn't as easy like it's that. not as easy like if you're going to play in the in the hardware and in the product world i'm going to call it right product world um that's a challenging world to play in because you really need to understand what your marketplace is and who your competitors are Right. And their ability to innovate and the dollars they have to innovate. These are all constraints that are important that you understand. Now, for us, we had best tech engineering services. Right. Which kept us going throughout. Because oh, okay. people always need engineering services. Absolutely. So we always had a constant revenue. I'll say constant, more or less constant revenue source uh, from the engineering service division that we had, which allowed us to fund some of our innovation but we were very limited in what we could do, right? In terms of having um, the dollars to, to innovate. Uh, so speaking of the products, so you yeah. also developed this Energy One solution. Yes. Basically, it's an energy yeah. uh, solution for a ventilation system, combining yeah. hardware and software solutions in one place. Yeah, that's correct. So um, it is an energy management solution. And uh, ventilation is just one application of it, to be okay. specific. So right. we can control any types of asset uh, with the ob objective to reduce the energy uh, footprint that that asset Because utilizes. the energy cost for ventilation is a big component for any traditional mining operations. And that's correct. And that's why we focused in on that. So, um, yeah, so we focused in on, on ventilation as the area where... Uh, it's the most energy intensive assets in a mine. And it's also an area that there's more opportunity for reducing energy consumption. Okay. Um, now energy one eco is an application that does that on a high level. The technology uh, foundation that we've developed around it is, is a technology uh, that's brand new to the world. And it's also a framework that's brand new and we call it industrial plug and play. So it's a whole new way to integrate process control systems. And we designed this platform and Energy One Eco sits on top of that. 
Oh, so it's okay. a pretty sophisticated system, and we've been working on various iterations of this over the last, uh, I'd say, 10 years. Right. Yeah. So I read online that you started the trial at uh, uh, Valet's Coleman Mine. Yes. So how did you persuade the mining companies at the early stage yeah. of those technologies yeah. that uh, yeah, this actually would provide value yeah. to your organization? Yeah. So the, the, the value statement is very simple. It's like you said, it's about energy conservation. Uh, typical mine, uh, their energy bill is like your $10 million, something like that. Um, and uh, no, actually, that's the bill for, for ventilation. And we can reduce that by half. So we can save them anywhere between 4 to $5 million a year. Oh wow! Okay, by controlling the fans better, mm -hmm. but it's not a simple it's not a simple um, implementation. There's right. a couple hundred fans underground, and they're everywhere. There's they're miles apart. Right. So the the challenge is not really to control them. The challenge is to connect them together. Right. Into so a that's system. That's exactly. really the challenge. And also for mining, safety plays a big role yes. in there. So. In case, for example, there is a disconnection, how, how is the system going to respond to that? Well, the system has smarts right at the device level underground. Right. So if ever the communications are lost, the system recognizes that and they just turn fans on. So there's no opportunity to reduce energy, which is really why the system's there. But at least the fans are on and you're keeping it safe. Right. So that's that's all customizable and configurable by the users. And that should send a warning to to the control yeah, center. and the control center understands that as well. It's a two way. Okay, two perfect. Way so that's kind of a fail safe mechanism yeah. built in that's place. That's built into that solution. Every, every solution we we implement, we always look at how to make sure that it's fail safe. Right. Absolutely. So you uh, signed with Valet and also Glencore for uh, Energy One Solutions. Yeah. So right now we have um, Rio Tinto up in uh, Dyavik that's been using that technology for at least six years and they're off grid. So all their power is uh, generated and we save them $5 million a year. And it's purely on, on energy savings, consumption savings. Uh, locally here, we have uh, Kid Creek in Timmins that uses energy one. And we also have Valet that, uh, that they've had the technology integrated fully into their Totten mine. And uh, by this summer, we'll have it integrated at Coleman and Creighton. So Excellent. we're very, it's very uh, pleased. growing yeah. very fast. We're very pleased about that. Yeah, Because I guess once it, initially the customers see the benefits, it's very quick payback period. Very quick very, payback. Uh, easy sale. Yeah. yeah. So here in Ontario, we're lucky because, well, no, we're not lucky, I should say. <laughs> We have an opportunity to save a lot of money for our clients because there's two aspects to energy that are important. One is the consumption. So that's how much energy you use every minute. Right. So you turn your lights on, you're using energy, turn them off, you're not. So that's energy consumption. But there's also demand. And demand is uh, is uh, is part of the bill that, um, that our clients uh, have to pay. And what demand is, is that um, as a province, we consume energy. Right. And uh, and the system has to provide for that demand and that demand changes throughout the day because it looks at the whole province as a whole. Right, this right. is something that's that's uh, an Ontario system. OK, so as we're demanding energy, all of us, all of us users, uh, the system has to bring online more generation capacity to meet that demand. Right. And as soon as you bring another generator online, that costs lots of money. Exactly. Okay. So the more generators they have, the more costly it is. So not only do we pay for consumption, we pay for demand. Okay. So our clients, what they do is um, are they're built on the amount of demand they're consuming whenever a peak occurs in, right. in the province. Right. And so if we can make sure that our clients are um, are consuming are demanding less of the system when these peaks occur, then we save them millions of dollars every every year as well. So those are the two aspects of energy management that we uh, help our clients with. Okay, I see. So yeah. uh, how do you think that that system would be impacted by the industry going electrical as a general trend? Yeah, um, I'm not sure that, um, well, because it's electric, they're gonna consume more electricity. Right. So it's gonna become even more important. 
right but at the same time management. exactly you need okay. to manage for example charging or consumption yeah. uh, schedule them accordingly. exactly yeah so it's going to be even more important to have systems like this when they go electric so are you planning absolutely. to do some more efforts in the energy management side uh, given the yeah. electrification trend absolutely um so right now we're integrating uh ai into our uh, application uh which is uh so we need to learn these trends and what's happening with the demand so that we can make sure that we're um, bringing the assets down at the right time. So we need to predict when these demands are, demand peaks are gonna occur. And as we're increasing the load, like battery electrification and all that, right. well, it's gonna become, those are inputs into the AI solution that we need to consider as well. Right. So that's, that's how we're fitting that in. So we will continue to look at these developments. Okay, excellent. So yeah. you, with, services and products and uh, uh, engineering design you expanded your clientele to overseas uh yes um so we um we sold as i saw on your website yeah. uh, an older version there's english french and there's spanish yeah we we actually sold uh, our solution in mexico um, back in 2006 i think is when we sold uh, one instance of, of the solution, uh, but our solution was really not ready to be uh, um, to be sold on a global scale. We didn't have enough uh, capacity or enough users here in Canada uh, to make it um, so that the mining industry globally would look at this and say, yeah, this is a, a solution that's proven. I see, because and they want to play safe. They want to play safe. Bets. They want to play safe, yeah. So uh, we decided to back away from it for a little while. And now that we have a good uptake here locally, it's time now to re-energize re that, that program. Okay, so uh, you mentioned in your pre-interview that you plan to build Bestec as a boutique engineering firm. Yeah, initially. But then yeah. there was one time yeah. uh, there is an appetite change in the yeah. industry where they wanted to go to this total solution uh, methodology as That's opposed correct. to outsourcing components yeah. of their uh, demands. So uh, yeah. how, how did you manage the uh, change of mm -hmm. flavor in mm -hmm. your uh, clients? Mm -hmm. So so that's, uh, again, that's one of those crossroads that you hit, right? And uh, and when you're an entrepreneur, you, got, you have to understand you had a crossroads and yet you need to make it need to pivot your organization so at the time we were very con we were comfortable being a boutique shop right and uh and our the marketplace was asking for boutiques to help them right and the marketplace being our the mining and share clients right and uh at a certain point our clients decided that they wanted to to eat pcm so an entire engineering, engineering procurement construct and manage oh, okay so basically I have a mind to build. I'm a client here. I have a mind to build. I got a billion dollars and I'm going to ask one partner to build that mine for me. That's what, that's what our clients did. So they went to one engineering company and said, I want you to build my mine. So as right. opposed to going to different boutiques of companies to execute the mining project, they went to one engineering company and said, you do the whole thing for me. And when that happened, well, those engineering companies who got the contracts had no interest in working with us. Right. Because they had internal resources that could do what we did. Right. So they didn't want to leverage the boutiques that were out here. They wanted to do everything themselves. So when that happened, our marketplace shriveled up and we saw that right away. And, uh, and the first big project that we really lost on, which typically we were involved in was that's how Falcon Visual Nickel Rim came on board. Right, and it's a rim. big mine. It's too. a big mine, a billion dollar project. And they went EPCM to one. And we barely got any work out of that mine. And that's a local, a local mine here in Sudbury. So right away we saw this as a big, a big issue for our, our model, and we needed to change our model. So what do you do? Well, you gotta compete against the big guy. So you gotta become right. a big guy. You have to start providing more than just automation services but program. so at that point yeah. the the revenue shrank oh, yeah. because of the you know they outsourced these big projects as yeah. a one total solution to bigger True. players out there yeah. and on the other hand you want to grow your business to 
a full-fledged yeah. service provider. Yes. So where is that uh, yeah. funding coming from? Did you have to source yeah. for a second round or? Yeah. No, we never, we never sourced, we never got external funding ever in our entire history of Best Deck and Shift. I'll talk about it a minute later if you want, but okay. yeah. But for now, Best Deck was always self-funded. We okay. never got never got rounds of funding. So, so you guys managed your finances. Really yeah, we well, managed okay. it well. We managed well, and we always had profits every year. We've been in business, so we managed we managed very well. Um, so when you look at Best Deck, we saw so there's two types of work that we do. We do big project work. We we get involved in big capital projects like a new mine development, and we also get involved into the daily operational budget, sustainable mm -hmm. budget. And our right. clients typically do work that way. They have teams that do sustainable work for them year right. over year, improvements in their process. And they have teams that execute like big capital projects. Right. So we were working in both. Okay. We had a position in both. But now that large capital work was no longer available to us because of the EPCM model that our clients were following. Right. right? So we had a stability still in our, uh, in our sustainable Engineering work. Service, right. So we were good on that. Um, but we saw our capital project work diminish. So we said, look, we don't, we want to still play in the, on the big capital projects in order to stay in that game. We need to diversify our services and go multi, multi-engineering. I guess that was not a very easy decision because it requires a lot of, uh, team building, building and yeah. uh, also Correct. Uh, resources allocation to yeah. make sure that when the next big contract came you were ready so yeah. after you expanded your team mm -hmm. when was mm -hmm. the next time that you actually were able to bid yeah. on a uh, larger project so the larger project that uh, the first large project that we won was uh fraser morgan for uh, at the time strata i think yeah was the company right so yeah that was the first one fraser morgan yeah where we were selected as a prime prime engineering company so what, what, and which is small it was a small it's a, still a mining project, but it was an existing mine that was operating, so it wasn't anything near a billion dollars. But anyway, that was but our first big project. But Where, still, I think that's a validation of yeah, your business model absolutely. change. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it's a validation of the model change. The fact that we're we're asked to bid on these projects, but again, it you know it wasn't a billion dollar brand new mine. It was a capital project of a magnitude that we could bid on and now that we're much bigger now we can go and bid on on those bigger jobs and okay. also uh, in our quest to become you know a larger company uh, we're also integrating a new mining division in our in our company this year so right. we offer all the the standard engineering services mechanical civil structural electrical power right and now we're bringing a mining team so we can do feasibility work and studies and be that true uh consultant in the mining industry excellent so mm -hmm. as your business grew uh i guess culture would be a very mm -hmm. important part mm -hmm. of the development of your mm -hmm. team so mm -hmm. what how how do you develop your corporate culture within yeah. Best Act? Yeah. What are how do you define your culture? Yeah, time? so that's a good question. Because um, when we first started the company, it was very uh, it was like a home, a little small home feel to it, right? Right. And uh, a lot of the people that joined us loved that about us. You know, it felt like small. It was you, people still feel like they're heard, uh, and and they matter. Right. Right. Uh, they're not just a number working for a big organization. And they also understand that when they come to work, the success of this business relies on them. Like, right. You know, everybody that works here, the the success of this business relies on everyone. So they have the sense right? of ownership. And ownership is there. Exactly. So um, as we've been growing, uh, we've maintained that, that sense of ownership with our employees and we get them involved and we are very open and we share all of our information with our employees so they know they know what's coming up they know the pipeline that's coming up they know financially where we where we sit and uh and i think it's important because um i've been involved now for 25 years and i've seen the industry cycle and our business cycles along with the economy right and so we need to adjust our our, our business as this economy fluctuates um so i think it's fair uh, to our employees that we're very open and we we share with them where we think things are going to go so that they can be ready 
because sometimes it's not always fun. Right. Right. Sometimes there's tough. The economy is tough and we have to make some temporary decisions on uh, on uh, on how much we pay each other and and whether or not there's work for for people, period. Okay, so before we touch yeah. on that, uh, so if I summarize yeah. your culture uh, based on what you told me, mm -hmm. transparency, yeah. uh, openness, yeah. and then uh, ownership. Ownership and innovation. Innovation. I And it's a culture of that. So we have these things. So in, in order to, uh, um, to, to uh, put them in buckets, we have these things that we call the big six. Right. So there's six initiatives that we have that we always talk about with our employees. So one of them is operational excellence. Right. Everything we do, we have to be very efficient at what we do. So operational excellence is, is a key foundation to our culture. And sales per employee, that says a lot about your efficiency yeah. and operational excellence. Correct. Um, and we also look at uh, evolution and growth of the company, but of all the individuals within it. Okay, right. we want them to have a good experience. They come in at a, with a certain skill set, a certain level of knowledge, and we want them to grow and evolve. So it's not just our business growing and evolving, it's the individual growing and evolving. So that's part of, of who we are. Right. Um, so these are some of these examples of what we call our big six that we, which form really form the part of our culture. Oh, okay. Being client focus. Right. right. Without our clients, we have nothing. So understand your relationship with your client is key. It's very important. And everybody has a, has a duty to maintain a relationship with a client right. at some level. Right. right. So client focus is very important. Okay. So some examples. Right. So I don't want to make this a happy-go-lucky story. Yeah. So you yeah. touched actually on this. Um, yeah. One of the, during our pre-interview, you told me, one of the lowest moments in mm -hmm. Bestex history was actually in 2008-2009 post-crisis. Yeah. Post yes. uh, and then all of a sudden, the funding or projects from these mining clients just mm -hmm. evaporated. Yeah. Can you tell us a, a little bit about that, Sam? Yeah. Uh, how did you... Yeah, that, was a very, uh, that was a very stressful moment in my life, for sure. Um, because my family at Bestex is the same as my family at home. Right. I treat them the same way. And... Uh, when I know that I can't take care of them, that's that's very hard. Um, so when that the collapse of the uh, the marketplace occurred, uh, there's a general panic in all industry to just ratchet down and minimize the costs going out. So we felt that, like you said, all of our, our working pipeline went from six, seven months of work ahead of us to maybe two weeks oh, wow. in a matter of a month. Like it was like drastic how it happened. And me as a, I was still a young business owner back then. I hadn't really gone through these massive, this is a massive downturn like that. And I didn't know it was going to happen. Like I, I thought maybe that would be the end of the company. I really thought that I, I just had, didn't know where things were going to go. How long was this great recession going to last? And it was, it was challenging and you turn TV on and all you got was the end of the world. You know, right. and, and it was it was tough. So we uh, I think at the time when when it first came on board, we we had 80 employees and, and we went down to 50 within a matter of a couple of months. And then uh, we also uh, agreed to take pay cuts. So senior management got 50 percent pay cut management, 20 and all the other employees got 10. And everybody did it without batting an eye. Like no. I heard zero complaints. Nobody came to me and said, I don't want to do this. They all want to do this. That is really because, impressive. Given yeah, the size of the yeah, company back then. Yeah. And it was important because we knew that we needed to keep the team together. We need to do things to keep the team together because we didn't know how long this was going to last. And you know, Right. But so yeah. you typically you are a very optimistic yeah. guy seeing the world oh, as yeah. the opportunities Absolutely. as opposed to obstacles. Yeah. Uh, but you said you were, were you fearful? And Absolutely. So, how, how did you, when you were fearful yeah. yourself, how did you persuade your employees that mm -hmm. we're going to ride through this yeah. and we're going to thrive? Yeah. So <laughs> that's, that's one of the biggest challenges that you have as a leader of an organization. Because when, so you, go, you, cause when you go at home, you just, you don't sleep at night because you fear. You just, so you, actually you just don't know. Oh, absolutely. Like I, it was, it was, it was unreal. But when you come here, you got to be that face of positivity 
right? And you, you have to bring up your people and you have to show them that there's opportunities still. So, so again, I go back to my, ba my basic message when you're, to me, a solid business owner's plan. Right. Okay. So what is so, your plan back So then? this is what, here's the plan. We got to write it out. Okay. In order to write it out, we need to minimize our costs. So we need to do the, the, the salary uh, cutbacks to maintain the team. And we're going to do that. And if we do that, it's going to allow us to stay in the game for another six yeah, a months. A little longer, right. You know, and we'll evaluate as we go. And we'll think about, well, where where else can we be offering our services? I mean, there's still work out there. Now we got to rethink, where is that work? But we have time now because the plan says we have time if we execute these cuts. And we did. And we executed the plan. And six or seven months later, things were ramping back up. And those that the, was the tough you know, six, the, six. Yeah, six, it was tough months. six months. And the 20 employees or so that we had to lay off, they were back up in, with us within six months. Right. So, and, and we're lucky here in Canada because we have a social net. Right. 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 And we knew that that social net was there to catch them. Right. Right. And keep them. And when we're ready to go back, well, they were there and right, right. ramped it back right. up. Yeah. Excellent. So, speaking of that, actually, can you tell us a little bit more about the first time actually you decided to let go of someone? What was your emotional mm -hmm. experience back then? Yeah, that's tough. The, yeah. the first one. The first one? Oh, my God. I don't really recall the first one. Or one but of they've the always, I've never ones liked, you remember. I have never liked doing that. I've never liked doing that. And because um, I personally feel it's a failure. It's a big failure on my part. Okay. Um, most of the people that that I, I've let go personally is because you realize at some point that there's not a good fit. Okay. And, and I take it personally because I feel like I should have recognized that before bringing them on. Right. Because when I bring somebody on to me, it's a commitment. You know, I've assessed you. I think you can be a good part of my team and I'm making a commitment to you when I'm hiring you that we're going to make this work. At some point you realize that it's not going to work. And so to have that crucial conversation with someone and most people that I've had the crucial conversation with, they realize it. This doesn't come as a surprise. Right. But it's, it's, I guess it's in the approach. Right. And my right. approach has always been, look, here, here's what's going on. Here's what's happening. It, it's not working out for you. It's not working out for me. These are the reasons why we both agree on it. You need to move on. I'm going to help you move on. Right. I'm going to give you time. And I'm going to help you find a job elsewhere or whatever. Oh, wow. That's, you know what I mean? That's great. Yeah. That's great. I had this one employee who, um, who wanted to try it on his own. And uh, as he was an accounting background, so I said, no problem. I'll buy you a notebook. I'll buy you some software. And that'll get you going to start off. You even did local. that? Yeah, I did that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's really impressive. Yeah. And, as that's, a yeah, and that's part employer. of the employer. Yeah. And that's part of the commitment that I personally make to someone when I bring them on board. You know, that's actually exactly why I think I, I was trying to, you know, talk to your ex-employees and mm -hmm. clients and I, I mm -hmm. just couldn't find anything <laughs> major negative comments yeah. about Best Tech. And then yeah. usually I, I pride myself in doing the research. <laughs> so I was, that says a lot about yeah. uh, how this yeah. company treats yeah. uh, its people. Hey, look, I'm telling you, like, I'll say 90, 95% of our actions are good, right? Uh, you can't please everyone so of course not right i don't think i that's not right to think you can right so i'm sure you'll find some if you look hard enough understood <laughs> yeah uh so now that uh given the size of uh, best tech especially after you developed those physical products and expanded mm -hmm. to a full-fledged service provider mm -hmm. uh the, the company really grew especially after you wrote out the 0809 yes. crisis yeah uh Given the size of Best Tech nowadays, and you plan to even expand further, like you talked earlier, to shifting and kind of spinning off yeah. uh, other companies, yeah. how do you maintain agility and then uh, also continuous innovation or improvement right. in your orga organization? Yeah. Well, I think it. Um, it uh, our objective right now is um, to have focus. Okay, and. So for me, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a serial entrepreneur, and I've got all these ideas and all of these things I want to do. And to try to do them all in, in one bucket is, doesn't work. 
because you like to focus now and the messaging to the world as well, your clients on what you are, what you offer for them. So we tried to do all this within the context of Best Deck and we had a, we had challenges. So how, how are you um, how are you a, an innovator of products when you're an engineering company? Right. So right. that that's that's hard to sell. It's hard to sell to the community and, and, and our clients as well, even within the context of Best Deck, where right now we're all it's all about service work. Well, we offer multidisciplinary disciplinary engineering. We also offer all of the automation right in the house. And we also offer all the ITIS services as well, which is not traditional to engineering companies. Right. Because we want a long lasting relationship with our clients. So when you engage with Best Tech, okay, we're going to help you design your plant. We're going to help you automate and breathe life into that plant to make it work. And we're going to be there for the duration of that plant, helping you making sure that it's always efficient. And we're also going to bolt on all the uh, information technology and information services that you need to assess your plant. So all the back end stuff. Right. So we want to be your partner of choice from soup to nuts on the whole thing. And we want that relationship to be a long lasting relationship for the life of that asset for you. Right. That is best tech. And that makes us unique right. in the world of, of engineering companies, I think. Right. So we want to keep building on that. We want to keep building on that model. Okay. okay. So, I guess as you grow the company, like one of the major challenges that I see with larger corporations is yes. that it's very difficult to align the vision and mm -hmm. then the, the direction of the company yes. from senior management to yes. frontline employees. Yeah. And how, what systems yeah. or uh, mm -hmm. methods do you have okay. in place to uh, yeah. ensure that alignment? Right. So. Um, so again, I'll go back on the theme of focus, right? Um, so you understand the best tech focus we have, and right. we also have the shifting focus, which is very product centric. When we talk about that in a minute, right? Um, but to answer your question, is how do you how do you grow this and maintain that the efficient operation, right? And so what we've learned over the, over the years, and to me, the business model is very important, right? And right now we we try to operate on on a very flat structure. Okay. Okay. I see. We try to run this as flat as possible, so that you don't have all this hierarchy and I complexity. See. Okay. Because the more hierarchy you have within an organization, then the communications become challenging. So the flatter the organization, the easier it is to communicate across. I see. To everyone, right? Because gotcha. you're flat. So that's one of the things that we try to do is maintain the flat, a flat uh, infrastructure, and obviously using technology. Right. So we, with the flat structure, how do you motivate people? to, you know, uh, develop within the corporate yeah. environment. Yeah. Uh, for example, promotion, mm -hmm. how do yeah. you make sure that you recognize mm -hmm. people that, uh, you know, excel mm -hmm. on their jobs? Well, we don't make management sexy. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of ours. No, I'm just kidding about that. But there's two types of people. There's technical people and then right. there's management folks, people who actually like to manage people. They're two separate types of individuals. And so we try to provide an opportunity for both types of individuals. And I think with an organization where you can actually move them from group to group, so you still maintain your flat structure, but they have an opportunity to, to, to challenge themselves by moving them into a different team. Okay, right? I see. So it's more of a team-based approach. So this whole concept of having a hierarchy and, and, your, and your career being you moving up a ladder, eh, there's no ladders here because it's flat. Okay. So for you, you have to be an individual that, that loves either technical and being moved from team to team, right? And then we have geography as well. So we're, we're going across Canada now with our company. So there's opportunities for you to move and, you know, you could live your life. Right, right. right? Your, life, your life is, is business, but it's also your personal life and the experiences around you have with experiencing the world, right? So okay, so it's yeah. centered around flexibility, yeah. team-oriented, and yeah. experience-focused yeah. uh, promotion or recognition exactly. for individual employees. Yeah. Okay. So we want them to understand and and be motivated by that, and even within our clients, like there's opportunities to work in all these different plants and wrap your head around the processes that are within all these different industries and different plants. So if you're a technical person, you're gonna love that opportunity to learn. Right. Right. So it's all about learning.
So you talked about uh, you, you plan to spin off uh, different components of Best Tech into more focused groups. That's right. Uh, so what do you have mm -hmm. planned yeah. uh, in your mind? Okay, so all that innovation part, which really defined Best Tech right. in a big way, and all these solutions that we've been developing, we've taken that out of the Best Tech brand and we've created Shift Inc. And Shift is about providing solutions for industry. So right. this is a company that we started a year and a half ago. And uh, I think last year our revenues were $2 million, which was very good as a startup. Oh, wow. And this year we're doubling the, the revenues within shifting. So it's oh, wow. very, it's, you know, I think the model works and we're seeing that you're seeing that work and best tech as well. Best tech is going across Canada now and with multiple offices. Uh, so we're seeing having that focus paying off now and growing that growing these companies because they have a very different uh, offering to our clients. And how we manage these companies is different and the personnel with them are very, very different. So I, so it's a good way, I think, to, to, to segregate it. And then we have a third company, Admit, that we're launching this year as well, okay. which is also about supply chain management. And that one is different because one of your questions was about um, financing. So this is a third corporation that we're part owners of and we're, we have investors that are external that are not part of Shift or Best Act that are that are playing a part in admit so that's another business okay excellent so mm -hmm. uh the now the business has been growing so fast yeah. uh, i think faster than ever yeah now, knowing what you know today yeah. uh what would you have done differently from the beginning mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, growing the company or uh, developing the company yeah. well lessons learned a eh? school of hard knocks <laughs> <laughs> uh sometimes i don't know it's uh it's okay school of harnox is good um people people are the key okay so depending on the complexity of the job make sure that you have the right person enroll for the complexity of that job um when we were launching all of our different um multidisciplinary services having a key resource so for example, when you have a mechanical civil, civil engineering team, having the right resource to grow that group, the right person, the right person to grow that group is critical. So it's all about people, right? And understanding that you really need that key principal person to really develop and grow that team. And not just to grow the team, but to get the credibility in the eyes of the client. Right, right, right? I, so, see, I see. So, you know, lesson learned for me is that I, don't try something unless you have the right person leading it. Okay, so or else people you're gonna first. spin your yeah, you're gonna spin your wheels for a long time. Oh okay. the right person there. Okay, okay, that actually reminds me of a book by uh, I think James Collin. Uh, always get the right people on the bus, wrong people off the bus from, before you do any major uh, from good to great. Exactly. Right. One yes. of the best books you should read. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I read it several times now. Yeah. And so now that the company is growing well, were you able to put money into your personal bank account? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. How, yeah. So how do you manage your personal finances? Do you yeah. invest or you donate or? Yeah. So, um, so right now I've been at it for 25 years. So I'm in a position where I can do these things. It wasn't always that way. Right. So the first year that I started working, I didn't pay myself one penny. Oh, wow. For one year, I didn't pay myself a salary. So that little fund that I had created for me there over the four or five years, safety net. that was, that's what I used to live for, for a year because you got to build up your company and the cash that you make has to be invested in your company to keep it moving forward, you know, pay your people, buy your equipment and so on and so forth. So, so it was always that way. And then for the, I say the next 10 years when NS came on board, we paid ourselves, uh, I, I would consider a very modest salary. I think we we're paying ourselves like $50,000 a year. Oh, wow. For 10 years, we did that. Okay. And we would only pay ourselves a little bit more at the year end. If we had a good year, you know, we might pay ourselves 10, 20,000 more, maybe if we had an okay year. Right. So you're not like, you're not those 10 years, those first 10 years, I tell you, like, they're not, it's not, it's not the best. <laughs> Right. Yeah, yeah. But we knew imagine. that we wanted to build. We wanted to build, and and when we got to a certain capacity, a certain profit margin, then we started paying ourselves a little bit more money, and and so yeah, so I managed to do quite well for myself, and uh, so much so that um, last year my wife and I decided to donate a hundred thousand dollars to Neo Kids, 
and Bestec did the same. So it's two hundred thousand dollar donation to Neo Kids, which is a, a, um, a hospital for 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 uh, for young children in northeastern Ontario. Uh, so we have sick kids in Toronto. Right. And, uh, so we feel that we need something to help service Northern Ontario. So thank you very much for your generosity. Yeah. There. So we're That's extremely, yeah, we're extremely pleased to be able to do that and fortunate. And to me, well, why not? The community has been good to me. Right. And uh, so to pay back. So in your pre-interview, actually, I didn't know this. Uh, the the province or the uh, government has agreed to mm -hmm. uh, help build the Neil Kids Hospital. Yes. But the community has to... Uh, come up with a certain amount of money. Yeah, right? that's correct. Yeah, that's yeah. about ten percent. Yeah, and that's true of any any kind of project. It's not just Neo Kids. So any hospital that you walk into, um, oftentimes you'll see a board and people's names are listed there as initial donors. And when I would go through the hospital and I would see these boards, I, I never really understood that without the ten percent raised by these people the 90% was, wouldn't have been put in by the government. I, I didn't know that, but that's a common, uh, that's a common framework that, uh, that our federal government utilizes. So they'll invest in your community, but you have to invest in your community first. Right. And if, if the community is willing to find the 10% that's needed, then they'll invest in your community. Excellent. Yeah. So for our audience members that would like to donate, how can they do that? Well, I'm sure if you go to Neo Kids, the Neo Kids the website, Foundation. yeah, you'll, uh, there's many ways I'm sure we can. And then and I, I think online, if you see online uh, on the LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever, you can follow Neo Kids. You can see people are donating steady and it can be simple. Like uh, this one young lady, she did a bake sale and raised $500. She's just, I don't know, maybe 12 years old. I'm not sure. And she donated, she made a bake sale and raised five hundred dollars. So I it's all these little things, things are really beautiful. Impressive. Like yeah. it's uh, it's nice that the community is getting involved and backing the project. So thank you everyone that's out there doing that. Excellent, excellent. So you mentioned uh, your partner retired last year, mm -hmm. and then that's part of the reason you decided to spin off these companies to yes. kind of uh, reorganize the financial structure. Yeah. So what? Is your exit or a succession plan mm -hmm. that uh, you envision? Yeah. So what we integrated in the company is uh, we created a shareholder group. Okay. So basically we sold to our employees. Right. Both Dennis and I did that last year. So, and I'm still part of that shareholder group, but Dennis since he retired while he's out of the shareholder group. So now we have 10 people that are sh actual shareholders in the corporation. So that's a framework that allows us to bring in new shareholders, but also allows all the existing shareholders that are in that team a way to exit as well and retire. Oh, okay. So now we have a you know a common way to move move us forward as we grow and develop this organization that will just follow that same framework. Excellent. Yeah. So wh how would you envision the organization will continue to grow after your exit? Uh, but the mm -hmm. reason I'm asking this mm -hmm. is actually more for our decision makers out there in the audience. Okay. Uh, given the quick turnover yeah. in general and in the mining industry when it comes to management movement, yeah. uh, it's often people feel lost mm -hmm. during the transition mm -hmm. uh, of management team. And mm -hmm. then I was joking about change mm -hmm. of flavor earlier uh, in mm -hmm. management, but uh, mm -hmm. so what, what kind of advice would mm -hmm. you give or share with our mm -hmm. decision makers out there that would like to continue the innovation or growth of mm -hmm. their team uh, mm -hmm. despite all this personnel turnover or adversity? Okay. Well, let's say, uh, I'm not sure how to answer that question if you're looking at it from the perspective of a business owner, perspective in general. You know, so I look at our clients, there's a lot of turn turnover there. Right. So at the management level, we keep seeing new executives brought into role every couple of years. So we find it challenging to work within that environment because, you know, we're all trying to build our relationships, understand where they want to take their organization. And we try to bolt ourselves onto their vision. Right. And when those visions keep changing, it makes it very challenging for companies like mine to be in alignment when you see that change. So that's from our perspective, um, from the perspective of all the employees that work for those organizations, it's hard for them as well, right? Because they see their vision and mission change every couple of years. So it's hard to maintain that. So, um, so for the big organizations, you know, I don't want to be disrespectful and to, to them, um, because they manage or, a size of an organization that I, I can't comprehend because it's 
orders of magnitude very different in mind. But for me, it's as if they could somehow create a vision and a mission that was sustainable for a period of 10 years. And it didn't matter who you brought in to be the senior leadership, that they would buy into that vision. And I think that would help their organization maintain that focus throughout and not have to readapt and rechange all the time because it is stressful on people. For a small company, how do you maintain that vision when the leadership is gone? So for example, Bestec, um, when I leave, I know that I have 10 owners that believe in the vision because they helped create it. Right. Okay. So it's not about me. It's about us. Right. And that's important. Okay. Okay. If you make that vision a shared vision that everybody believes in, then it doesn't matter you as the leader, if you're there or not, it'll continue. Okay. Especially if you have good people. Excellent. So my last question, what kind of a legacy do you want to leave to your kids? Mm -hmm. To my kids? <laughs> Oh, you know, I, for my kids, I want them. Hmm. Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> Take your time. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I want them to see the world like I see the world. As an amazing opportunity to do whatever you want. Right. And to not be constrained, not be constrained by the people around you, not be constrained by whatever ideas you got in your mind, you know, to be open minded and to really see all the opportunities that are there and to go for it. You know, that's what I want to leave my kids with. Um, so it's not about leaving them a business that they can come and run. That's, that's not really what I'm looking for them. Now, that doesn't mean that they can't come and be a part of this business. Um, but they have to have that first sense of, of innovation and, and that sense that they can do whatever they want in the world. And if they want to make best tech part of that world and create a whole world around them and be, and be, uh, uh, uh good partners in society and communities, then, uh, that's good. That's what See, I'd like for them to, to do. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, so I guess for people that are are kind of a early in their career or mm -hmm. even starting to uh, think about starting up their own um, things. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess they need mentorship. Are you open to mentor Absolutely. people? Okay. Yeah, I love mentoring and people. Where can people find more about you or your company? Uh, you can go online, bestec at bestec.com or, uh, or www.bestec.com or shifting.com and admit inc.com so you'll you, you can find us linkedin is a good place to find our coordinates if you want to and yeah we're definitely willing to help okay excellent so here's the fun part my favorite part <laughs> mindpreneur trivia okay uh oh downtown toronto or lakefront sudbury lakefront sudbury that's easy okay <laughs> Dominion Republic or Whistler, BC for vacation? Or what's your favorite vacation place? Manitoulin Island. Cool. <laughs> PC or Mac? Oh, PC. <laughs> Wolves or Sudbury Five? Wolves. <laughs> Ecobee or Nest? Ecobee or Nest? Yeah, so um, it's the uh, smart thermal. Yeah, uh, I've got an Ecobee, so I guess I'll have to go with Ecobee. <laughs> That's what I have to <laughs> But I also have a home automation system, Control 4. So you want to look into that there? That's that's what you need to be checking that out. Control, control 4? Control 4, yeah. Excellent. Complete, yeah. complete home automation. Excellent. Mm -hmm. That's a great conversation. And thanks very much for okay. your time today, Mark. Okay, see you on. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay. It's a Take great, uh, I think it's a great service that you're uh, providing for our community. And I, I wish you all the best. Thanks very mm -hmm. much.